Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, welcome to the annual meeting of the New Champions 2017, where the theme of the meeting is on inclusive growth in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we, um, this, is a, this is a press conference uh, on science under attack. So with support from the, from the European Council, leading, leading scientists examine why scientific, why scientific evidence appears to be under attack, the need for borderless science in an era of growing protectionism, and why trust in key scientific theories has been eroded and the implications for business and society. I'm delighted to be joined by, um, by some brilliant speakers. Thank you very much for coming. On my immediate left is Jean-Pierre Bourbignon, who's president of the European Research Council based in Brussels. I'm also joined by Lou Bai, of, uh, um, professor of the medical school at Tsinghua University. And Lou Bai, you also, um, you also have, a, have a blog on, um, on public science communication, I believe that's correct. Um, and then uh, um, Vanessa Wood uh, of the Department for Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. And is it fair to say an, an expert in, um, in battery uh, technology and energy storage? And lastly, we have um, Maria Elena Torres Padilla, who's director of the Institute for Epigenetics and Stem, Hells, uh, and stem Cells of Helmholtz Centrum München in Germany. Apologies for my accent there. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll hear from our speakers. First for you. Um. Thank you very much. So yes, the, the topic uh, of our the press conference and the really exchange is uh, about, uh, in fact, the, the fact that we are in a world where science is, pay, is uh, really playing a very important role in inspiring a lot of uh, innovation in many different ways, uh, new technologies and all kinds. And at the same time, we are also in a world in which uh, knowledge is uh, viewed uh, differently and sometimes uh, some um, very basic uh, facts are actually challenged. Actually, for scientists, being challenged is normal. That's uh, our life all the time. When we make statements, uh, they are challenged. But um, definitely, if we cannot uh, make, the, make the case that uh, some facts are well established, then uh, the whole uh, reason for the existence of science is really under, under question. So this is why uh, this uh, new era, which has uh, actually expanded recently, um, is uh, really forcing us to, to really uh, insist on the fact that uh, it's very important that the information should be reliable. Uh, it should be reliable because if you want to use information and develop uh, new techniques or develop new products or develop new usage, it's extremely critical that you know what you are doing, that is you, you can rely on the, on the information. So this um, element is uh, very decisive. Uh, at the uh, European Research Council, we are uh, supporting uh, research uh, of all kinds, and two, the two ladies who are here are actually grantees of the European Research Council, so they, they will say more about their research. But as uh, introductory remarks, I wanted to say how critical it is for the development of um, the fourth industrial society that um, this question of uh, reliability of sources and uh, really the, the, the establishing facts is at the heart of the science for all its history, but presently, because of the importance of uh, these new developments, uh, it's really a, not a secondary matter at all. It's a very simple matter. So the importance of, of, of establishing facts. Um, Dr. Lubai? Um. All right, so I'm a little bit, um, how do I, Larry, about uh, what do I, what should I speak? I saw most people sitting in the audience are Chinese, and I'm, maybe I want to ask, so do you guys want to listen to Chinese or English? Oh, well, I guess it's, no, 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 it's no, going please, to be please, English. You can speak in Chinese, fine. please. <laughs> so, uh, I want to say, I mean, actually, I, I said in the other session yesterday, in, uh, in Science We Trust, uh, I've uh, spoken about this, is that I see there's a, science is under attack, but we have to look deeper. And what's happening, there are two major factors that made it happen, okay? Uh, this is happening in, in UK, in Europe, and in United States in particular. And also, it's, China is not immune, China is the same. Uh, that is, one factor is um, there's an anti-establishment sentiment that's going on 
and they want to have a way to express themselves. And they express themselves by voting. They express themselves by anonymous comments on the internet. So that's one major factor that's very, very influential. And uh, there are people who could say, oh, it's all fake news. Oh, it's not true. And if you, no matter what you say, especially in respectable government or, or, or famous professors or so forth, they say, we don't believe it. And so that's the second factor is the internet, and especially mobile internet, that made things uh, dramatically changed. Uh, it changed in two ways. One is that the speed of communication become very, very fast. And I'll, I'll get to that uh, uh, of how we report uh, Nobel Prize, for example. We do it within 30 minutes in high quality. And the reason we could do it is not because we have really highly competent reporters. It's because we have scientists, we have people who know the person. Okay, I'll get to that. So one is the speed of communication become very, very fast. And two is because the, the degree of the extent of communication become very, very wide. And this was because you can do what's called a forwarding, right? So if you have something that you feel interesting, you immediately forward to your next person, and you feel next person, and this is the power of Facebook. So I'll just uh, say these two before I get to um, uh, how we're going to face this. This is the, the uh, you know, you say science is an, an, an attack of, uh, it's, it's just a phenomenon. We're going to look into deep, deeper. But before I pass on to our next uh, guest, I would say that my um, title is not just a professor that I'm here, a uh, professor at Tsinghua University. Uh, two other scientists, one is uh, uh, Professor Xie Yu of Princeton University, and the other is Professor Yi Rao of Peking University, and I, the three of us, we made this, um, it's not a blog. It's I, I a social media, Sorry. just like <laughs> social uh, media Facebook. Platform. Yeah, it's a social media platform. We do articles, we do conference, we do debate, we do uh, all kinds of things which I will elaborate. And I'm an edit, edit, what you call it, edit, I'm a founder of that. And this is now becoming, uh, if not the most popular, but one of the most popular science media in China. Uh, the people sitting in the audience, they, they know uh, what, they, what we do. So with that, I'll pass on to the next person. And, uh, can I just say, if you, if you prefer to speak in Chinese to, to any of the audience here, you're, you're no, very I'm welcome to do. We have translation way, I mean, headsets. It, it, okay. it, it's probably make your life easier. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'd like to maybe make a few comments about why I feel that uh, it's so important that um, science be something we pursue um, globally um, and in a global cooperation. I think many of the challenges we face today as a society um, are really uh, uh, things that impact all of us around the world, whether they be healthcare, energy, uh, sustainability. And um, my personal um, area of uh, expertise is in the energy-related uh, sector. And I think if we look um, at the last 100 years and the amazing transformative growth that we've had there, it's really been driven by the ability um, and the innovation in terms of um, producing electricity and then distributing that uh, electricity efficiently. And now the next challenge we face, I think, in the next um, decades to come is actually also how we store that energy. And if we look at that um, challenge of energy storage, we see what an international challenge that is. If you take any lithium-ion battery that you use in your cell phone or your computer, um, you have components that literally come from all over the world. So you have um, nickel and um, cobalt that are being mined in Africa. You have graphite that comes from China or uh, Canada. These are processed in uh, different locations throughout Europe um, and in Asia. They're then assembled and manufactured into the um, uh, components that we might see actually in front of us uh, when we take our phone apart in different countries. And then, of course, we're all users of these technologies. And there are many companies uh, in each of our countries that we come from that package these technologies in new ways to give us the products that we love to use. And so this is really highlights that um, 
for companies and for those of us who do science and research, we can't just think um, nationalistically. We really have to understand how all the countries in the world are involved in sourcing and distributing and manufacturing the products we use. And this is why we need to actually communicate across all these um, sectors in the value chain to really make innovation possible for the next generation where we're going to need um, energy storage at unprecedented levels. So if we want to have electric mobility and electric transport, uh, we're going to need to massively upscale uh, our production of energy storage technologies. And this really will enable us to, for example, start using more solar and wind energy. So these are intermittent renewables where we need to be able to store the energy effectively when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Um, and so I think this highlights why um, thinking globally about um, scientific challenges is so critical. It's not just uh, scientists, but it's also um, companies and industries that are trying to think and act globally. Um, and um, maybe perhaps to get back to one of the topics today, which is um, how sort of governmental agencies like the European Research Council can support this, I think I'd like to emphasize that you know, we have some, in my personal research field, we use many large-scale experimental and computational facilities. So examples of this would be synchrotron facilities, which are places where x-rays are produced, um, where we have large amounts of x-rays so that we can inspect different types of material and make new discoveries. And these are often projects that are sponsored by one nation, but where many nations get to come together and contribute to the development. So there's um, a synchrotron outside of Shanghai. There's one outside of Zurich, Switzerland. There, is, uh, there are synchrotron facilities in the United States. And that's actually the research the ERC, uh, the European Research Council, is funding for me is to try to go and use these facilities around the world. So in my project, we've been able to get resources to travel to uh, sources in uh, Japan and in the US uh, and in France. And I think this highlights, and these are all collaborations then that we make with scientists in these different nations that enable us to really advance our understanding in this particular case of battery technology. But I think um, these same sort of resources are so helpful for scientists and researchers um, trying to push forward uh, technology in many, many other fields as well. So. Thank you. So, well, I, um, you already heard my colleagues talking about um, why science under attack potentially. I would like to come back to that. But just to put you in frame, I'm in the life sciences sector. And um, in a way, I think that uh, apart from what you've heard about the reliability of the information, I would say that um, science is perceived as being under attack because I think part of the importance of the basic research is being misunderstood by the, uh, by the society. And uh, I think you all heard the um, conversation and the speech of Premier Lee uh, yesterday. And uh, I do believe that um, basic research is a key pillar for innovation. And without innovation, there is, there is really not development. So um, in a way, um, I see two major challenges. One is we actually probably need to engage more with you, with the public, to try to understand um, what is uh, our mission as scientists, what we can actually bring to the society. And I think our presence here as uh, both ERC grantees and young scientists is a testimony both from the ERC and from the World Economic Forum that this is actually something that we need to do. Um, and so that hopefully would cover uh, the first threat. And uh, the second one, I would agree with Vanessa in that um, we actually have to think about this globally. Um, so in my experience, actually, I'm originally from Mexico. I've been living in three different countries in Europe. I have been fortunate that the ERC gave me a funding. And I have been able to move across globally to talk equally well with colleagues in China, in Japan. Uh, science is really without uh, borders. And I think we actually have to protect that really very strongly. Um, so there is probably another question that you may be asking. Are we scientists responsible for the fact that maybe science has lost some trust? Um, maybe partly because maybe we have not been able to communicate with you what is our task, what is our um, hope for the future in technology, in companies development. So I believe that by engaging with the public much more actively, we probably can build a better society so that science can bring all the benefits that we uh, should be bringing to, to the society. Thank you. Um, 
do we have any do we have any questions from the floor? Okay, and the, just sorry. No, um, you. Or maybe I can take the lead yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, please, please. You have about, to say. Uh, I mean, the topic of today, I guess, is the science under attack. Yes. And we need to understand who is attacking this, attacking science, right? So I see science under attack by ordinary people. There are a sect of people who don't believe uh, what the science uh, is all about, okay? And this now we know this fraction of people, they're not small, they're quite big. And they could grow bigger if we don't do anything about it. The second is a science, uh, science attack by media, by, I'm not talking about a science media, but by media people. I'll, I'll give, uh, I will take one particular example to explain this all three. There are three elements that all involve in attacking science. So one is ordinary people. There are some people who just don't believe science and they, uh, for whatever reasons, political religions and uh, ignorance or whatever, there's a median people uh, who would like to uh, exaggerate the situation. And there's also politician. And the politician, there are two kinds of politician. <clears throat> One is that they're only interested in, in protecting their interests and their positions. So they would not speak up when they're needed to speak up. And there's a other kind, which now we see a lot in the United States, is that they just go with, you know, ignoring the facts, ignoring the truths, and they just go with um, uh, completely ridiculous, uh, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So I'll give you a particular example that's happening in China, which is the GM food. So we, I mean, it, it seems like we're all scientists, so we all know Apart from me, I'm, I'm uh, the, 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 the panelists are scientists, and we know the, the importance of GM food, and then uh, the, uh, I mean, the safety is not apparently an, uh, an issue. But there are people who exaggerate, and there's a one particular highly influential um, TV anchorman uh, who went out of his way to attack GM food. And uh, he actually made, he went to the United States and cherry picking interview scientists who have uh, some con uh, reservation about uh, some aspect of GM food, cherry picking those and made a documentary film and go all over the China to say GM food is gonna kill, it's gonna extinct a humankind. Um, so that's one. And then uh, lots and lots of fans, he has very huge fan base, and lots and lots of fans start uh, exaggerating, you know, uh, amplifying this message. And third, the government officials, I mean, I've talked to uh, the vice minister of agriculture and so forth, sir, and they say, oh, we cannot say anything. Why don't you guys say, your scientists used to say, and we are not gonna say, because if we say, we'll, we will be attacked. So these are the, Three, uh, uh, I said, I, I said three forces that are attacking science. So I will just throw this on the table, and then I will say I'll I'll be critical of scientists ourselves, okay? Because we're all scientists. Because I, um, I wanted to ask, so what what's I mean, you're doing something with your social media platform, right. yeah, um, yeah. But what so, do you feel scientists need so to do? I'll, I'll talk about uh, what we we have been doing, but. I first be critical of ourselves, scientists. Scientists um, the, fall into three different aspects of when it comes to science communication. They always say, what I do is important. Sorry, I always say that too, myself. They saw always, and there's a, a huge pressure from the society, they say, what's the use of your uh, things? Especially for us to do basic science, so epigenetics, stem cells, um, neuroscience the medians and the public will always say, what's the use? And science, scientists follow the track of say, oh, what I do could ultimately, I'll give you one example of a very basic uh, study of glucose transport structure, okay? And a scientist made a small mistake of saying, oh, if we stop that, we could uh, uh, starve the cancer cells and then 
or then immediate media is everywhere. So that's one mistake of scientists by saying the usefulness. Science does not have to be useful. Science is pursuing human knowledge. Second is that <coughs> science, scientists communicate science mostly from their own perspective. It's, I know a lot, I'll, I'll tell you. <coughs> they don't usually go to the other side and say, what people want to hear. It's like uh, when you do a company, you want to hear what the consumer wants, not what the product you make, right? The third one is that a lot of scientists speak science for the interest of getting fundings. You know, they lobby for big um, uh, science facility, they lobby for their own fundings, and uh, the, I would say 80, 90% of scientists don't want to come out uh, to talk about it, uh, don't have the courage or don't have the interest or don't have, you know, but there are some that come out to talk, they fall into these three categories. So um, that's our problem, our scientists' problem, and um, then I'll say uh, maybe later um, others can chip in, uh, what can we do about it? What scientists could do about it? Do we have any do we have any questions from the, from the floor? Okay. In the in the meantime, I just um, I, well, I want to ask you what, what what you think scientists can do about it. Uh, me. Yes, for that. Scientists. Could you? Scientists. Sorry. What can scientists, uh, what, what, sorry, what, 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 can oh, scientists what, what can scientists do about okay, this? Yeah. Um, so I think um, one thing that I think is a challenge, um, probably not only for media but also for those of us trying to figure out how to communicate most effectively uh, about what we're passionate about is that information is um, available so quickly uh, today. And often um, we're asked as consumers of information to make very fast judgments um, about uh, topics or to try to condense arguments into just uh, very quick snapshots. And I think um, if we look at um, Science, often science is not simple. It's often something that can't be expressed in a very um, easy one sentence uh, uh, claim with a lot of buzzwords. And so I think we as, as scientists um, have to make sure um, we educate um, young students and we who are at university level have to make sure we reach out to even younger students in, in middle school so they understand that Understanding something requires a lot of time. One has to question always, what is the source of my information? Um, how did um, the theory um, that I'm understanding now evolve? How, what is the 100 year history behind um, um, the understanding that we have today? And to really then be able to make critical thinking and um, really support intellectual curiosity among our young people I think is critical to um, changing how we as scientists can also then dialogue um, with those uh, in the world who, who haven't chosen to pursue science as a career. So I, um, I personally believe that um, perhaps those of us at universities and I think many universities around the world have many outreach programs to local schools and I think these are very exciting opportunities where we can start even engaging with young people and explaining the complexity and difficulties of, of understanding uh, something well and making one's own uh, informed opinions about it. I want to go to you. Do you, do you think, uh, and, uh, because we have about five minutes left, um, uh, do, do you feel that science, particularly in your field, uh, uh, maybe if you could just briefly sort of, briefly sort of dis describe your field, is under attack, and what are the implications of this? And then... Uh, yeah, so as I said, I'm in the life sciences sector, in a sp specifically in a uh, field of stem cells and epigenetics, um, which uh, really tries to understand how we, the genes are functioning in, in your bodies. Uh, I could say that, um, and I, I would join also the comments that you just heard, that part of the, um, on their attack is, uh, I think it's twofold. One is that sometimes scientists have given false hopes too early to the public, and at some point I guess that we can maybe lose a little bit of credibility. But I think part of the reason is because we haven't been able to reach out to the public, and the public to us, uh, in understanding what the scientific endeavor is. In other words, what is basic research for? Uh, it takes time to get to a finding. And I also share the, the, the view of um, uh, 
uh, of our colleagues that science is not necessarily to be useful in, in the near future, right? It's, it's, it's like art. We are in the pursuit of truth. Uh, and um, eventually that may be uh, useful later on. So uh, there is part of under attack, as I said, is probably the undermining the importance of basic research is what I think would be my, my fear. And I think we have to work uh, on it by education, by uh, going outwards to the policy makers, to the school, to the younger generation to really, you know, uh, transmit our passion for the science. You both talk about sort of education and the yeah. and the and, and the and the younger and the importance of educating the younger generation. Um, uh, Jean Pierre, any uh, any thoughts? Yes, I think uh, what has been said is uh, is exactly right in the sense that um, scientists definitely have to have a much more open uh, attitude towards the public, which means uh, they have to dedicate more energy to be um, really uh, open to, to the challenges coming from the public and respond in an appropriate way, which means uh, in particular to convey uh, something very critical for scientists, which is the fact that uh, the time frame of uh, the work of scientists is not just uh, hours or days, it, it could be years or decades, and this is the way it goes. And very often uh, the first thing you, you realize is that the problem you're tackling actually is not one problem but many different problems. One example I, I, I can give is, of course, um, cancer has been an illness which has been known uh, existing uh, for uh, forever, but um, we, we understand it better and better. And now maybe the main discovery is really that uh, we should not talk about cancer, but cancers. That is, there are really many different forms of cancers, and definitely some of them now, we know very well how to treat them, but some others for the, for the moment who have no clue. So it, it shows that mm -hmm fundamental process by which this is happening uh, has not been uh, understood in the right way. For some of them now we have already the tools, but for some others the tools are not there. It's only by understanding this difference that we can really make progress. So I think uh, it's, it's very important for scientists to take the time to convey this message that uh, something which appears simple, for example giving one name for something, could be actually misleading because actually it could cover very different situations for which you have solution for some, you don't have yet solution for others, and it's only by recognizing this that we are making progress. I think we have, have maybe, maybe two, two minutes left. Um, I, I want to, um, we sort of spoke briefly just, just uh, when we were outside on, on how um, yeah, there, there can be certain sciences or technologies resulting from, from scientific technology that, that are very sort of misunderstood or, or people don't really consider much until they realize how much it impacts them. I, you know, one example is maybe artificial intelligence. People didn't really worry about it or really uh, think that they needed to understand it until they realized that automation could yeah, undermine, their, undermine their jobs. Um, are, there, um, are there any sort of technologies that you feel um, just if you can keep your comments very, very brief, just because of time, um, that you um, that people need to be really be aware of over the next over the next five years. We'll go. We'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think in, in my field, and I think that's quite global. Uh, there's two: uh, genetic engineering using the CRISPR-Cas9 methods that I'm sure you are familiar, and also the use of epigenetic drugs for treating disease. And I think I think this has to be put on the table and discussed of the ethical and social implications of both technologies. Can you foresee any sort of particular discoveries that might? I, sorry. It's a very, it's a very simplistic question. Yeah, I mean, the, the genetic uh, engineering, the human germline, has been a subject of debate over the last at least two years. Uh, there's no solution to the problem yet, but I think it has to be discussed in a forum of multiple stakeholders um, because it has the potential to maybe cure, but it also has the potential of having a lot of side effects that are often not discussed with the public. Uh, same thing for epigenetic drugs, which are actually there. There are many of them in the market, for example, for treatment of uh, cancer. And I think uh, the, the potential of those drugs could still be used more. Okay. Vanessa? Yeah, I mean, I think um, more and more um, uh, individuals and the small communities are trying to understand how to become more um, energy uh, independent. So maybe trying to figure out what sort of solar cells should I buy for my home? Or if a community wants to install a small microgrid, um, and this has really raised um, interest uh, level of people to understand these technologies, what's available, what might be coming in the future, and also really understand the whole um, ec uh, economics also behind that and how uh, the energy markets work. So I think this is uh, an exciting area um, that we see in my field. Dubai. 
maybe I would not talk about my own science, but take the okay. last minute of saying how we're going to deal with this science under attack, right? And I'm not going. There are many different ways, but the way that we choose is to use the mobile uh, internet and then and have this thing called WeChat that that is very very popular. That one thing WeChat make it possible to do is that anyone. I mean, I was sitting in the panel with the uh, uh, scientific Americans and the scientists, and they're all NPR, they're all uh, established media, they're authorities, but I'm an amateur and I'm a scientist myself, but I could do media, and I probably could do media better uh, 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 by involving many, many, many scientists. Um, so WeChat is, uh, we have this thing called a public WeChat, uh, uh, this is the, what we do in China. and. Um, but when you do in the modern days, in today's world of uh, internet, artificial intelligence, and so forth, uh, you need to understand, first of all, the nature of communication. People's attention span is very short, so you can't write a long article. So you have to deliver a message in an in a episodic ma yeah. a manner. And uh, people want to hear entertainment rather than uh, they want to spend the time for entertainment. So what we like to do can about science is that to tell the story of discovery, the process of discovery, and the scientists involved. Scientists have a very interesting life, just like a football players. So we made the scientists stars, okay? And then the next thing is this, uh, everyone wants to participate. They, didn't, they don't want to just uh, listen no, no. or hear, but they want to participate. So we uh, have them, we, for example, one thing we did was to have epigenetics debate. Where, where audience can, you know, just write in their own questions and then scientists can answer. So, Jean-Pierre, just a few sentences. Well, no, well, thank you for listening to this uh, debate. Uh, thank you for moderating it. I think uh, for us it's a very important moment because in a sense uh, science is uh, on the spot. Uh, but I think we, it's a very good uh, opportunity for us to also uh, recall what is really the fundamentals in, in science, which is really um, establishing uh, the truth and for us uh, establishing the truth is a very complicated process with a back and forth checking but this back, back and forth checking is uh, indispensable and uh, this is the basis for science. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.